to our next speaker, who is another trainee, Suzanne Hartford from the National Cancer Institute. Thank you, Suzanne. Right. I'd, like, I'd also like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk today about my work of the interaction of BRCA2 and PALB2 and how it is essential for genome stability. So BRCA2 is actually known as the caretaker of the genome. It's a tumor suppressor with, well, with known roles in the breast and ovarian and pancreatic cancers, as well as in Fanconi anemia, which is actually a condition up from a series of genes that result in developmental abnormalities, bone marrow failure, anemia, leukemia, and then later on in life, those patients end up with solid tumor formation. BRCA2 has roles in homologous recombination, or it's actually involved in the um, basically the localization of the RAD51 filament to allow for invasion of the, into the DNA, into the template so that it can repair double strand breaks, as well as DNA replication fork protection so that when replication forks are stalled, there is no chewback of the nascent DNA, nascent DNA, as well as maintaining the GA2M checkpoint. So BRCA, BRCA2 itself is a huge protein with 300, with 3,000 and 329 amino acids. It's a huge protein with many interacting partners. I'm only showing a few different of the BRCA2 uh, domains right here. We have the BRC repeats, which are actually very important in RAD51 uh, recruitment. We have the RAD, uh, sec separate RAD51 domain, which is actually important in RAD51 stability. It promotes homologous recombination, and this, re re this region has also been shown to help maintain the nascent strands at stalled replication forks, and, and also helps prevent premature entry into mitosis. Uh, the single-stranded DNA binding domain has been shown that when it's lost, it actually does lead to a loss of homologous recombination, and unless the, unless the PALB2 binding domain is intact. The PALB2 binding domain itself is important in promoting homologous recombination, yet it's been shown to complement the loss of the DNA binding domain. Uh, BRCA2, there's a couple mouse models. BRCA2 mouse models are when they are null, they're embryonic lethal. There's two hypomorphic n n models, one that deletes part of the region of, bracket of the BRC repeats, which does lead to some, leads to perinatal, uh, perinatal lethality, but there are some surviving animals and this will come to thymic lymphomas early on in life. And then the hypomorphic allele here that also de deletes this RAD51 binding domain here are susceptible to tumors at one, between one and two years of age. Yet this is a huge protein, and what about these actual other interacting domains? It's particularly the PALB2 and the single-stranded domain, is there really functional redundancies between the ability of BRCA2 being able to bind, bind single-stranded DNA versus having the PALB2 present for actual interaction? So what, I really, what I'm studying here is the interaction with BRCA2 and PALB2. Now, PALB2 itself is the partner and localizer of BRCA2. It's also a tumor suppressor with known roles in the hereditary breast and ovarian cancers, as well with Fanconi anemia. Itself is a 131 kilodalton protein that not only binds the BRCA2, but BRCA1, as well as RAD51 and single-stranded DNA. Yet, at null mice of PALB2 are actually similar, embryonic lethality is very similar to the BRCA2, and PALB2 also has roles in the DNA repair in DNA repair, DNA fork protection, as well as the cell cycle checkpoints. So with actually shown to be very similar functions between PALB2 and BRCA2, is, can PALB2 itself um, complement the, loss, the in, loss of interaction with BRCA2 since it also binds RAD51? So a uh, peptide study I had actually sh shown where the interaction domain uh, with, uh, in BRCA2 with PALB2, it's basically there was two key amino acids. There was this W31 as well as G25R. W31 actually completely loses interaction with the PALB2, and it actually is cell lethal in an ES cell-based assay, showing that, yes, this interaction is important in cell survival. But what about this one where you actually just decrease the interaction with PALB2 and the G25R? So in an ES cell-based assay from our lab, we see cell growth that's comparable to wild type, but there is a reduction in homologous recombination efficiency as well as moderate increase in chromosomal aberrations as well as sensitivity to DNA damage in agents. So this actually sounds like a good mouse model work, but it seems like it may be viable. So we actually we created a point mutation in the third exon of the BRCA2 mouse model causing this, G, this glycine to 25 to arginine uh, change within the BRCA2 protein. 
And so they actually ended up using multiple crosses within the study. Besides the G25R HET, which is actually comparable to wild type in my crosses, I used the G25R homozygous, a G25R homozygous across the BRCA2 nulls, so now you only have one copy of G25R within the genome versus the homozygous where you have two copies of that allele. Then I crossed the G25R homozygous with a PALB2 HET knockout as, and the G25R hemizygous with a PALB2 HET knockout. So the first thing to notice right when these animals were born, the ones that there's one with the, here with the small mice. However, everything has Mendelian viability. So w what is actually going on with these mice? So what we actually do see in the adult males of the G25R hemizygous, we have a reduction in testis size, and fertility is actually decreased over time. By 25 weeks of age, we do see some animals that are infertile. Yet here with the G25R hemizygous PALB2 HET, we actually have these uh, tiny testes that were formed. So we decided to actually look at the three-week-old males during the first wave of meiosis so we can actually see the dynamics since meiosis is, has a lot of homologous recombination that does occur. Here's what a G25R HET, we have the normal meiotic cells on the outside and then getting into the haploid cells filling in the center here. The G25R homozygous appears like wild type. Yet here with the G25R hemizygous, it, looks, it appears that the cells are hung up in meiosis and there's no haploid cells filling in the center of the tub a spermatogenic tubule at this point. Yet here with the G25R hemizygous, PALB2 HET, it appears to be germ cells that are there, and so I stained it with ma the mouse VASA homolog to actually show that the germ cells are formed in this mutant. Yet when these animals reach maturation in an adult male, the germ cells are then lost showing that there was some failure of initiation of reentry into the spermatic genetic program within those animals. So within the G25R hemizygous animals, why are they seem to be hung up in meiosis at three weeks of age, yet the animals do are somewhat fertile, are fertile later on? So we did some meiotic spreads where we actually see, the first thing I stained for in the zygotine stage cells was for localization of the RAD51 at the sites of DNA damage in these cells, and I did foci counts here in the G25R HET and the G25R homozygous. We have relatively normal amounts of RAD51 foci, but there is a reduction but not complete loss of RAD51 foci within this meiotic spread. And what that actually leads to is later on in, in this, uh, at the pacotene stage, is that there's actually a persistence of the DNA damage marker gamma H2AX within these cells, but eventually it does get cleared out and fertility is maintained for some time within these animals. So what we actually went on from here is actually we wanted to see what was going on at the cellular level. So we looked at the cell growth within a MEF. So there was actually a decreased cell growth as well as a G2M arrest in response to mitomycin C in the G25R hemizygous and the G25R hemizygous PALB2 het mice at cell lines, as well as when we did my, meta, we took this, these mitomycin C treated cells, which actually causes not only double, leads to double strand breaks, it's actually an inner strand crosslinker. DNA crosslinker, which actually causes replication stress as well. And in these metaphase spreads, we have numerous metaphase abnormalities within the G25R homozygous PALB2 HET, G25R hemizygous, and the G25R hemizygous with PALB2. However, the G25R homozygous appeared normal within this assay. And so, we, of course, with the RAD51 foci seen in the decreased within the meiotic spreads, we also did a simple quantification here within on the MEFs. And so, so what we actually did see is normal foci within the wild type, a double head, homozygous, and then a slight reduction in the G25R homozygous PALB2 head and a more severe reduction in our hemizygous and hemizygous PALB2 head. So from here, we was like, okay, we're definitely seeing a, a problem within the homologous recombination ability of these mice. What about their replication fork protection ability? So I performed a DNA fiber assay, which actually involves pulsing the cells with two thymidine analogs for equal amount of time. We have the CLDU followed by the IDU. And then we treat with just a replication stress inhibitor hydroxyurea for three hours. And then we see how well the replication fork is maintained by the ability of BRCA2 and PALB2 interaction. And so then I measure the ratio of the IDU to CLDU. It should be around one in e either of these cases. Yet when you actually lose BRCA2 or PALB2 interaction, you should get a chew back of the DNA replication for it because you're losing that protection. And then the ratio would end up being less than one. 
So here's an example of what we see actually with the wild type. After untreated, you get a, about a one ratio, and then the after treatment with the four, mi four millimolar HU, we actually have about an equal ratio. It's actually what I call loss of protections, only about 15 to 20 percent within these when I actually score them all. So there is some chew back within wild type cells. The PAL B2 hat had similar um, chew back of the fork. Yet when we actually went into a double hat, as well as the G25 homozygous, we're now at 20 to 25 percent loss of DNA replication fork protection. When we get to the G25R homozygous, PAL B2 hat, we have a severe chew back of the DNA replication fork here of 35 percent of the cells have lost their DNA replication fork protection. Then here in the G25R hemizygous, as well as the hemizygous and PAL B2 hat, we also have a 35 percent loss of DNA replication fork protection within these cells. So overall, with all this data showing that here we have a based on how much PALB2 and BRCA2 G25 are mutation are within the cell, we get this basically increase in severity of phenotype as well as different um, loss of protection within the DNA replication fork and RAD51 foci localization. So what do we actually see within the animals when we age them for tumor formation? So we did a two-year study, and down here we're actually represented in everything in weeks, and then here's tum tumor-free survival within these animals. Um, the G25R, basically the controls, the G25R homozygous and the G25R homozygous with PAL-B2 had actually had normal tumor-free survival t time points, but the G25R hemizygous had a decreased survival and with increased tumor formation. And then when we put in the PAL-B2 hat, we had this severe loss of protection with the, of, during DNA replica of the, we had a severe increased tumor formation. So what did we actually see at necropsy? Well, in the wild type, most of these animals, over 61 percent, did not have any tumors, and then we had a variety of tumors, the predominant ones being uh, B-cell lymphomas and osteosarcomas. When we went into the G25R homozygous, we actually did see an increase of the B-cell lymphomas at necropsy after two years of age. Yet when we went into, looked at the G25R hemizygous, we had a whole multiple types of tumors. We had B-cell lymphomas, T-cell lymphomas, and a number of animals actually had multiple tumors. Yet when the G25R hemizygous, PALB2 at almost all the animals had T-cell lymphoma formation. So in summary, this is a first ma basically mouse model with a point mutation that actually affects the functional interaction with one of BRCA2's binding partners. The G25R homozygous has no observable phenotype in the unstressed animals, yet we did have a mild perturbation of the DNA replication fork protection and a slight increase of tumor formation at the end of the study. The G25 of our hemizygous, there was, we had the meiotic progression defects due to persistent DNA damage, and this persistent de damage led to increased tumor formation. This, then with this, the phenotypes were all enhanced on the PALB2 HEP background, which, call, which also showed an impairment in initiation of spermatogenesis and a severely early tumor formation. And the loss of BRCA2, PALB2, and this whole loss of the, or decrease of PAL, BRCA2, PALB2 interaction leads to decreased cellular proliferation, decrease of RAD51 foci formation, loss of DNA replication fork protection, increased genomic instability, and this all really shows that the interaction of BRCA2 and PALB2 is essential to maintain genomic instability. Even if this is slightly perturbed, you do end up with genomic instability. So with that, I'd actually like to thank my mentor, uh, Sean Turan at NCI Frederick, as well as all the current members of the lab that actually helped out with this project. At, and as well as other people that also help with the project. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Any questions? Um, I do have one. Uh, so when you see your increased incidence of T cell lymphoma in your PALB HETS um, hemizygous animals, do you have an idea of why that is so predominant? Because T cell lymphomas tend to be kind of a, uh, a big problem in mouse tumor studies. I have, yeah, I currently don't understand why that that's specifically the type of tumor that these severe BRCA2 mutants tend to get. Um, the very severe uh, hypomorphic allele that deleted most of the BRC repeats, that's what they tended to get as well. But that's something I'd like to understand better as to why uh, thymic lymphomas are predominant within this specific type interaction. And they seem to occur pretty aggressively as well. Yes. Yes, yeah, Suzanne, I, uh, what genetic background were these mice uh, this, So this is still a mixed uh, 129B6 genetic background. 
So in general, that, that they tend to be mammary tumor resistant. I mean, are you making anything oh, of the distribution so of tumor types? Yeah, so there's, we don't know about mammary tumor formation, actually, because a lot of the BRCA2 mouse models do not get mammary tumors unless you actually is a conditional knockout. But I, have, we haven't, I don't think it's been checked in, let's say, the C3H strain. Okay. All right. Thank you, Okay, Suzanne. thank you.